Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. It's really a great privilege uh, to be here, so I thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm more than happy to share with you some elements about how I built my program of research. Um, as a 30,000 foot overview, uh, my program of research over the last 10 years or so has entailed multiple funders and also a transition from my origins at Penn uh, to where I am now at Oregon Health and Science University. And in that time, I've really focused on heart failure that most of us uh, should at least know is the fastest growing cardiovascular disorder in the US and the number one re reason why adults are admitted to the hospital or even readmitted to the hospital for every reason. So it has enormous public health uh, consequences. So I was asked to really touch upon each one of these phases and kind of how it led um, to the next. And I'm uh, so thankful that it's kind of bookmarked uh, and bookended from uh, generous funding from NINR, both for my pre-doctoral training and my contemporary training and funding. So I'll start in the beginning. I had the great fortune of studying with um, Dr. Barbara Regal at University of Pennsylvania. And if you know that name, you probably know that uh, hers is linked to the self-care of heart failure probably more than anyone else's uh, in the world. And uh, pretty quickly became enamored um, some, um, somewhat with all of the behaviors in which a patient with heart failure has to engage on a day-to-day -day basis to help maintain their health to prevent exacerbations and uh, to prevent hospitalizations. And that, um, and the Regal model would be characterized as self-care maintenance. But I became way more enamored with um, how patients are able to recognize and respond to symptoms when they occur. Are they able to evaluate that symptom as even being linked to a chronic condition that they have called heart failure? Are they able to engage in some self-initiated treatment initiative and evaluate the effectiveness of said self-care behavior? And that would be considered self-care management. And when I got into this, this is really my origins in the science, I was really surprised that there wasn't much evidence based to support what at the time was a very large scientific premise that better self-care management was associated with better outcomes. And so I wrote and received a first round F31 sponsored by NINR to essentially make the link between self-care management and outcomes. So I'd like to highlight um, a few major publications from this work just as exemplars of the major findings. Uh, this is a paper that was published in Heart and Lung. Nancy Redeker and I were just talking about it again a minute ago. Uh, this is really the first evidence that patients who are more quickly able to recognize and respond to symptoms of heart failure compared with those who are less able to do so actually have better survival, followed up over a generous amount of time. And by that, I mean they're more likely to live free from death, emergency room visits, or hospitalizations for heart failure. And actually, they did so well that they actually had a similar survival profile compared with folks that were kind of symptom-free, didn't really have the symptoms associated with heart failure yet. So this was really my major entree into the scientific uh, stage as well. And probably the reason why the work got taken up into State of the Science reviews by the American Heart Association and why I was asked to con be a contributor to State of the S Science papers in this regard. Probably the more formative um, example for me was really integrating for the first time uh, biology and behavior. And so this sets the stage for me to continue along a line of inquiry that was much more focused on uh, integrative biobehavioral research. And so this is an example of a paper published in Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing, and it was really, uh, case in point, the first evidence that patients who are more quickly able to recognize and respond to heart failure symptoms actually have lower levels of some of the biomarkers that are used clinically to guide treatment and to even prognosticate, and those are metrics of uh, systemic inflammation and myocardial stress. And this is uh, also the work that, for which I was given one of the first awards from the American Heart Association, highlighting the innovation related to this as truly integrative biobehavioral research. So on to my postdoc. Um, one of the things that I began to observe, I'm an observationalist uh, really by nature, one of the things I observed uh, that was different between nurse scientists who were markedly successful and those who were less successful is those that had really set the stage in advancing the science were uh, gifted methodologically as well as their level of content expertise. Uh, and so one of the decisions that I had to make was, was I going to uh, do a postdoc that it would allow me to advance in my content expertise, or should I really develop a more extensive analytic armamentarium? And so probably is one of the best decisions I made in my entire career was to do a postdoc uh, outside of a school of nursing. I did it at a college of pharmacy and a center for health outcomes and pharmacoeconomics research. 
Uh, and I also did it in a setting that uh, fostered and provided a lots of opportunities for academic and industry partnerships. So in addition to my own uh, very concentrated coursework that allowed for mastery of an extensive arm, uh, uh, analytic armamentarium that focused on things like mixture modeling and uh, economic modeling, as well as meta-analytics. I also had to apply those techniques kind of immediately and at the pace of industry and use a scientific strategy that's been adopted by industry. So it's a, I learned a very different perspective and uh, gained a, a more extensive analytic armamentarium that has served me remarkably well. I would say the, the third thing is additional great mentoring, and I was lucky enough to train with Evo Abraham, who is a nurse scientist but also a nurse entrepreneur, and so was able to be mentored by somebody that um, has utilized remarkable just scientific strategy throughout his career as well. As an example of uh, some of my own work that has stemmed from this, um, this is kind of a complicated uh, diagram, but it's actually a very simple story. I really wanted to know, are there common patterns of comorbid conditions among adults who are admitted um, to the hospital with heart failure, and uh, are they at all helpful in differentiating inpatient outcomes like length of stay and mortality and cost? And I wanted to do this in a, in a savvy way. I never would have been able to envision addressing a question like this, nor uh, would I be able to kind of handle this analytically myself without the type of postdoctoral training I had. And so uh, simply put, we identified among 32 comorbid indicators that there were actually four distinct, highly differentiated, naturally occurring patterns of comorbid conditions. Indeed, they were linked to outcomes that are really messy to handle, like length of stay that's severely overdispersed and inflated, and cost that's not normally distributed and you have to do lots of transformation. And if I was going to have much credence in this finding, I'd have to then, of course, adjust for patient and hospital level characteristics that are associated with those outcomes as well. And since it's a nationwide inpatient sample, it's a complex sampling design. Also has to take into account that many patients are nested under fewer hospitals. So just as an example of the type of work that's uh, in published form that came from that type of training. I transitioned to uh, OHSU and um, as my first faculty position and actually received a K-12 on day six of my professional career, uh, which I am very thankful for. So there are many K-12s actually at Oregon Health and Science University. This particular one was uh, concentrated in women's health. It's actually sponsored by Office of Research in Women's Health and NICHD. And this is part of the Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health or BIRCH programs. And this was really perfect for me because it allowed me to kind of continue to build upon a program of research in biobehavioral care, uh, specifically in heart failure, but also add in some missing gender elements and sex-based elements that I, um, that I had not yet been able to integrate. Um, at the same time, I was becoming much more interested in what uh, you all know as an institute as symptom biology, but, but to me, I had focused so much on behavior in response to symptoms that I had kind of overlooked for many years how important the symptoms themselves are. Uh, and in heart failure, there's, there's really a bit of a conundrum. Actually, to summarize the world's literature about symptom biology and heart failure, there's little to no association between anything we can measure objectively and any type of patient-reported outcome in heart failure, including quality of life and symptoms. And that always bothered me. Actually, since I started, my group has put out a lot of uh, papers that contradict that statement. But I always thought we were kind of going about it wrong or looking at the wrong metrics, either from an objective standpoint or a subjective standpoint. So indeed, when you're kind of smart about it, or if this is your intent to find the biological underpinnings of symptomatology, you can actually do it with relative ease. So one of the things that we're able to find initially is that the size of the ventricle, how dilated the ventricle is, is directly associated with the level of physical symptomatology. So that's great, kind of a first finding of symptom biology, more so biomechanics. Uh, but also that that relationship is very different in women as it is in men. So a bigger ventricle means worse physical symptoms in men. A more narrow ventricle, for example, means worse uh, symptoms in women. So highlighting some of the, indeed, pathophysiological differences of this condition, about which we know most about older white men and less about younger non-white women. So to focus not only symptom biology, but the many instances wherein it is actually gender specific. One of the other things that we're able to do um, is uh, pair objective information with subjective information. So uh, developing a large cohort now of men and women, we're able to actually look at very detailed clinical information, anything that would be used clinically to prognosticate or to use to, uh, to guide clinical care, and then really robust uh, symptom assessments. 
we're able to really find out that there's really three types of ways in which symptoms and objective information uh, coalesce. Uh, in a vast minority, actually only 18% objective information and what you are asking the patient to tell you about what it's like to live with the condition at all coalesce. There's about another 18% or so that their symptoms are markedly worse than you would ever anticipate if you were to look at kind of their clinical information beforehand. <laughs> or if you were to engage in a clinical interview with the patient first, you would then later be surprised that their diagnostics are actually look quite reasonable. And actually in two out of three patients living with this condition, their uh, hemodynamics are just absolutely horrible, sometimes not even really compatible with life to the best of our, or of our knowledge, yet the symptom profile is relatively flat. And so a, a common clinical conundrum really in management of heart failure is, is what, as a clinician, do you follow? Do you follow the, the numbers or do you follow the symptoms? And the answer is yes. Because in both instances, you know, the, these are complementary uh, pieces of information. Uh, this puts symptom science on the stage that helps uh, with clinical prognostication. If you want to know somebody that's at risk for events, you have to look at both pieces of information. Uh, as soon as I got my K-12, um, I started to look at other grant mechanisms that I could hold at the same time um, as a K-12. And that's actually a, a limited list. I didn't want to have to forfeit it right away should I be lucky enough to be funded. And one such mechanism is uh, from the American Heart Association. So I, in, within my first year, I was lucky enough uh, to write and have funded a beginning grant and aid. Uh, this allowed me to generate uh, yet another prospective cohort of patients with heart failure. Uh, and to me, kind of pieced together the last remaining uh, puzzle piece from my predoctoral work, which was linking self-care management to quality of life, which had not really been done uh, to the extent that I felt comfortable yet. Uh, among other things. Uh, so simply put, there are two major ways in which self-care management behaviors change in heart failure. Patients can kind of either get better at recognizing and responding to symptoms when they occur. And in these patients, quality of life improves statistically markedly, but also in really clinically meaningful ways. The other way in which uh, self-care management can change is that people can get worse in their ability to recognize and respond to symptoms. And then in those patients, quality of life doesn't prove, improve at all. They have no change and certainly no benefit. Um, after a year of independent research, really, uh, and still kind of in the mentored phase from a K-12 in the beginning grant and aid, um, I submitted for an R01 within my first year on faculty. And this was really just um, serendipitous discovery of uh, a missing link in response to a therapy that's used commonly for advanced heart failure and also opportunity to partner with some scientists I had not yet worked with, like um, Dr. Kathleen Grady, who is well known for her work in advanced heart failure, and put forth um, what is just an absolutely brilliant study that NIRNR uh, picked up and funded on the first round. And so the focus of this research is on folks with advanced heart failure who have a mechanical pump inserted to really unload the ventricle, the pressure and the dimensions of the ventricle so that they can live to heart transplant uh, and or as their kind of final uh, therapy. And I'm absolutely in love with the study that we're kind of in the final phases of finishing and not just because it's mine and actually and I and R should love it, not just because it's theirs, but, but because it's really a state of the art uh, symptom study. So from a symptom science perspective alone, um, if you just study symptoms as they change in a cohort of heart failure patients, it's actually hard to see much change and it's hard to know what to make of that. But you put in a mechanical pump and unload pressure, if there's any time at which you're going to see a lot of change, here it is, and there's marked improvement uh, changes in these symptoms. So it's just a great place to study symptom science. As I mentioned before, you know, the world's literature would suggest that there's no relationship between what we can measure objectively about how the heart functions and how patients feel. Here again, this is a brilliant study because of the symptom biology piece. We link changes in biomarkers of heart failure pathogenesis with change in symptoms. And as I'll show in a minute, indeed, they occur almost in perfect parallel under this state. And the integrated biobehavioral piece is really fun for me too because uh, when this is all said and done, we'll look for novel biotypologies of response and see if there's anything that we can measure before we actually decide to put in one of these pumps that'll tell us about whether the person is more or less likely to respond to it. So I'll highlight um, each one of these elements. Um, you know, for better or worse, the patient outcome of choice for these pumps has been quality of life. And it's a, it's a good measure, you know, it's a good concept to measure, but it's really broad um, and it's 
can be difficult to characterize. It can be difficult for clinicians to understand. It can be difficult for patients and their families to kind of get what you mean when you say you're going to have early and sustained improvement in quality of life. So in addition to quality of life, because that's kind of compulsory to measure, uh, we also measure really robust metrics of physical, affective, and even social health, and we go right to the symptom level. Because it's much easier for me to have a conversation with somebody that's considering a VAD or even a clinician that, for example, the level of shortness of breath that your experience is likely to decrease by 75% at three months after the VAD, and even 50% at 30 days after a VAD. And it's easier for me to talk about how the mental health of a cohort of patients receiving these devices changes from borderline moderate to severe depression all the way to less than mild depression within a six-month period of time. And you can only really do that by studying these uh, in granularity and in detail and with intent. And in terms of the symptom biology, this is really the, the, one of the most spectacular parts of the study in my mind. And uh, again, like here is a graph showing a reduction in a biomarker that's used to tell us about myocardial stretch and a reduction in physical symptoms that occur in almost perfect par parallel, even mathematically. So, uh, so much for the notion that there's limited to no association between what we can measure objectively about heart failure pathogenesis and what, what patients feel. Uh, this is an exact opposite. So kind of advancing with the way that we think about these things uh, as a function of these results. And then finally, uh, with respect to the, the study that we call premise, is looking at some biotypologies of response. We essentially see two types of response to a pump that's designed to unload the ventricle. We see people that have a brilliant market and sustained improvement in quality of life. Or we see people that have no benefit in quality of life up to 30 days. They may still even be in the ICU with marginal and variable uh, increase at three months after a VAT implantation, and then it already starts to get worse, even within a short uh, duration of follow-up. And as it turns out, if you kind of look at their objective and clinical information beforehand, those that are super responders to this device, I mean, they feel brilliant. They feel so much better afterward, discharged early. They have a very classic picture of heart failure pathogenesis, meaning it's really simple. They have a big dilated heart, and they have muscle wasting. And so a pump designed to help with a dilated heart helps them tremendously. Folks that don't respond have a much more complicated, yeah, they have a big heart, but they have systemic inflammation, they have platelet activation, they have endothelial dysfunction, they have active myocyte injury, lots of comorbid conditions. And so this is a simple machine actually designed to help with heart failure, can't help with all of these things. So it really can't be a surprise to us that there's kind of two different types of response to this device. So that's where my research trajectory has taken me. I was asked uh, to wrap it up and to talk about where uh, it is taking me uh, in the future. And it is really with respect to symptom biology, self-management, and continued early career support. Uh, with respect to symptom biology, uh, I was lucky enough to be part of one of the first innovative questions initiative that was focused on symptom science. And right around that time, my group coined the term symptom biochemistry, biomechanics even things like symptom and hemodynamic mismatch. And it was really in a very heart failure-centric approach to symptom biology. Since then, we've actually taken quite a step back, uh, and we started to look at some metrics of accelerated aging or senescence, if you will. And so one of the biomarkers that we started to look at and that we'd like to continue to look at is called BARC-1, and it's a metric of metabolic senescence. That um, people that study heart failure like it because it has to do with adrenergic receptors. So not only is it um, the number one differentiated biomarker that we could possibly measure between folks that are about to get a VAD and people that look like them characteristically, except they're living in the community and doing quite well, is BARC-1. So it kind of trumps all other biomarkers and differenti differentiation of sick from well. But it also, there's this great relationship with the hallmark of symptom dyspnea. <laughs> Where dyspnea is actually a function of your chronological aging, yes, in part, but it's also a function of your, your biological aging. And so this is a great way for us to study the, kind of both of those things in combination, actual number and age, and then how accelerated is your aging process. With respect to the self-management, you know, I've moved well beyond the self of self-management. Uh, in my group in the past year or so has been working extensively to advance dyadic science and uh, in heart failure in particular and have, have been able to do so with some great international collaborations. Here's just an example of some of that work. We're able to show that a couple wherein the caregiver is doing way more than the patient to help manage heart failure. Uh, it, the caregiver is way more burdened and actually the patient has worse quality of life. 
In addition to that, we were really able to identify for the first time a true archetypology of types of couples managing heart failure together. And they do it with varying degrees of success, many of them really without much success at all. So in terms of self-management of heart failure, this is exactly what I mean about the type of science that needs to really be moved forward. And I will say that I benefited tremendously from early support from NINR with my own F31. But because I was also successful at securing an R01 early, I felt obligated potentially at an early time in my career to give back to other emerging nurse scientists. And I've been lucky enough to be the sponsor on four F31s. Uh, in a short period of time. And so I'm in a bit of the sandwich mentoring generation, much like I hear about between parents that have to take care of their kids and their aging parents, right? I am needing mentoring, hopefully less as we go. And at the same time, I spend a lot of my time mentoring. And this is exactly what uh, Barbara and I were asked to comment on uh, on behalf of the American Heart Association recently. So that's what I've done and that's what I'd like to do. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to come and present that to council. Thank you very much. Dr. Lee. Um, the floor is now open for questions. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm sure there are quite a few questions. Uh, maybe you intimidated. <laughs> 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 that was, I, I particularly, uh, I thought it was very helpful, the trajectory. We have a number of students, uh, graduate students and, and others in the room, and I think watching your trajectory is particularly informative in that you, it's been very deliberate, but it's quite methodical in terms of your looking for funding early. And then also, and David Banks, of course, will, will love this because he likes to give this advice to, to students, that, that you thought way ahead of time when you were going to need the new funding to apply for it. So you'd have uh, not only be able to get it, hopefully, but also have a chance to, to revise if you needed to. Um, uh, also, your ability to get funding with your K award is something that we hear a great deal about. And so that's instructive. That's actually helpful to us as well. Um, so we can refer people <laughs> because um, that is, you know, one of the things that we, we do get criticism about that the stipends or the, the funds available in the Ks are, are not quite enough. And yet you're, you're wanting to do research to develop develop your career. Um, so let me just ask this. You're, um, you're using a number of biomarkers. And these are some of these are familiar, and some of them are, are not as familiar to people. And so I'm wondering if you, um, you did interdisciplinary training, you said. But I'm wondering if um, how you approached learning, getting the new knowledge necessary, and the skill to be able to incorporate these uh, quite disparate components into your research as you started before you could weave them together. Yeah, so it's such an important consideration. So I was lucky enough to not only train with um, Barbara Rigo, but also with Nancy Tax, who is a neuro neuroendocrine physiologist, also happens to be a nurse. And the other person rounding out my dissertation was Ken Margulies, who's a well-known heart failure cardiologist and myocyte biologist. And so it was integrated into my training uh, from a research perspective and also my teaching uh, roles and responsibilities as a PhD student to take a lot more concentrated coursework in pathogenesis that's specific to heart failure and also to teach heart failure pathogenesis as part of my training program. So to learn it well enough that I could teach it in a, a relatively short period of time. But I think it's also continued collaboration with clinician scientists. I don't practice anymore, so it's really important for me to spend a lot of time immersed in heart failure care on rounds. And I often have three heart failure, advanced heart failure cardiologists uh, on my research team at any one time to make sure that I'm kind of capturing that element of pathogenesis, which is the, the piece that I feel least comf comfortable with, but still pretty comfortable with. So there are a couple of other lessons here um, that I would be remiss if I didn't point out, although they're probably um, obvious to most people in the audience. But I think that um, you know the interdisciplinary component clearly was an important one for you. But also, I'd like to comment on the mentoring. The fact that you are mentoring young people, albeit at an early stage of your career, is important. But also the idea that you're still being mentored and that lifelong learning concepts that we're hearing much more about, which then enable you to to more likely position yourself for success because you're not becoming comfortable where you are, but you're always growing into to something new. Um, that's also, as we understand it, as uh, you know, the future of science as we move forward, um, uh, one of the things that we're trying to reach young people with is that that really is the way it is. Um, most of our generation 
has ended up doing that through uh, one motivation or another. But it wasn't something that was necessarily planned and designed early on. Um, well, I have many more questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Anne. Anne. Sorry. And could you go to a microphone so we can hear your question? Thank you. So, um, did you some uh, like I said, most important piece, the symptom science and symptom biology are so exciting, and we here are very excited about that component of the research. Um, and I'm particularly interested in where you, the biomarker piece and where you think in the next five years, what types of biomarkers, you, you talked about Bark one but are you looking, are you thinking you're going to do more genetics or more proteomics? Are you thinking about going in the microbiome? I mean, I'm just curious what thought you've given to that and given where you are, where you might go. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a great question and something that uh, anyone that's in the scientific realm has to think about frequently, I think. So it's a common and important question. You know, I've, I've always um, started with proteomics, things that are cheap and easy to measure clinically and in peripheral blood. And so that's kind of my default. And uh, I'm more than happy to chase any of those signals. If I see something at the proteomic level, uh, I'm more than happy to chase it to the epigenome or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to do that independently to have the to maintain the skills to kind of be able to focus on the proteomics and also the clinical translational piece. But that's why I've also liaised with other new partners like Brad or Weezer at NYU, for example. Um, you know, if we talk about something like accelerated aging, I'll think about it from a proteomic standpoint, and he'll think about it uh, as a 54. Uh, an area 54 histone methylation sequence that he could test from a senescence standpoint. So I think it's um, to get it to the kind of common and clinical translational language, I think I've always, my default is always proteomics. And it gets back to, you know, something I learned about the Framingham, for example, many years ago. If it doesn't trump uh, cholesterol in predicting cardiovascular death, then that's really fancy that you can do that epigenetically, but we can still measure cholesterol. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one more yeah, question, yeah. Quick question as a follow-up on the biomarkers. I'm just curious to see um, how uh, consistent are they and what is the level of variability that you get from patient to patient or whether any kind of age component uh, is there um, or maybe gender that kind of drives it one way or the other. Yeah, so also a very important question with any type of biomarkers. Um, so first, I almost never measure just one biomarker. In fact, I never do. Usually we have a panel of seven or eight that we're interested in measuring as a means to kind of tease out some of the or get rid of some of the natural variability that may occur. So for example, if you have a high nt pro BNP as a metric of myocardial stress and you have a high STNF-alpha-R1, and you have a high ST2 and a high bark. well, that's going to tell me something very different than somebody that had a high level of one of those things. So we try to put forth essentially our portfolio of biomarkers that capture the complexity of the pathogenesis of the condition. So it's almost always a multiple marker strategy. But inherently, they all do are, are sensitive to variations in BMI, you know, creatinine clearance, gender, you name it. I mean, they all have a long list of other things that can, that can help explain their variability. So the multiple marker strategies uh, help with that. And, uh, as does um, measuring these things over time. Um, I think Donna had a question. Did it get answered? Yeah. No real question, perhaps, but more, more a comment. I think there are just lots of lessons that could be learned uh, from your career path just up to this point, and I'm sure it's going to bloom and grow and be fabulous uh, in the future. But I, I think about PhD students that, uh, you know, we often see and many of us here work with and, and the lessons that could be learned. Dr. Grady, I think, already mentioned several of those in terms of it appears that there's this nice structured path, and I'm sure you laid it all out in minute detail and exactly mm -hmm. just went through that. Uh, 
you know, that's the way everybody does. Yeah. So, no, I'm sure it's taking advantage of opportunities and and being thoughtful about it and, and so on. The mentoring piece, yeah, everybody can be a mentor, you yeah, know, indeed. and everybody needs to be mentored, and I think that's a lesson learned. Surrounding yourself with... Um, um, I always tell people, my mother was right, you're judged by the people you keep company with. And, um, you know, keeping company with successful people mm-hmm. and people that are moving forward, I think that's a real lesson lesson to be learned as well. And the other thing that, that I think is real interesting that, that you pointed out, you pointed out doing your, your postdoc outside of nursing. I think the notion of, of stretching yourself... And I think that's where sometimes a lot of our Ph.D. students, they do a dissertation, they get comfortable with this body of knowledge, and they are looking forward at that body of knowledge and not thinking about stretching yourself more, looking out in new directions, new people, Mm -hmm. new things, new ideas, maintaining that curiosity perhaps that led you to do a Ph.D. in the first place. And I think... The, the result of that um, would probably be the notion that you have some real creative work and some real neat things going on. And it's probably been sort of, you know, developed and molded and, and stimulated by that stretching yourself. And I think maybe that's what some of our PhD students especially need to, you know, a lesson that could be learned from your trajectory. You know, if you're real comfortable and you're in this nice path and feel good about it, you're probably not stretching yourself enough and looking for some new ideas. So very Indeed. cool. Nice, nice presentation. That's, a, that's a really interesting sentiment and quite accurate, I would suspect. Um, so I think the bottom line is uh, is we thank you for being here. And your video, when it gets on the website, it's probably going to get a lot of traffic. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank